this time on Graveyard Cars. Will Mark break his promise and sell an unsellable charger? Now, I've been with Mark a long time. Everything's for sale. When a running and driving car is sent to the dipper, what happens next is not expected. Every single piece of metal replaced on this car. When Mark breaks down a possible one of one 1970 convertible Cuda, how much of this original 383 FC7 beauty will survive? After that, it's all bad news. Is Shane's authority in the metal shop going to his head? It's my favorite part of putting a quarter panel on is having somebody else do it. Has Will lost control of his team or just his faculties? <laughs> Finally, Mark and Tony tackle a mystery that may stump them both. I can't connect the dots on this and figure out why it was done. Beneath the fog, behind the rust, sometimes they come back. There's only one internationally recognized Mopar master, Mark Warman, joined by his friends, family, and dream team, the Ghouls. Nobody wants to take on the stuff that we take on. Reviving the past. 100% untouched survivor. Resurrecting the icons of American muscle. We are the Shaolin priests of Mopar. Uncovering stories. It's the baddest car we have here. And restoring dreams. The most iconic muscle car on the planet. Putting cars back where they belong. On the road. Here we go. Beyond a passion. Oh, that's wild. One man's obsession. <laughs> with Mopar Perfection. This is Graveyard Cars. Currently, we have another 69 Dodge Charger moving through the metal shop. Believe it or not, this is another Daytona tribute car. Remember, we just went over one very recently where I showed you about the nose cone and the wing and how we make it all fit. We're doing another one just ironically at the same exact time. Now, I actually used to own this car. I took this car in on trade on a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. Now, when this car first showed up, I remember unloading it off of the truck. I had the guys out there with me. I was going around how clean and original it was. So one of these two cars I took in on trade. Okay. So it's actually a GYC car. It's a little 69 Charger 318 that he's owned since 1980. It's every bit the peach that the owner said it was. I mean, he's had this car since like 81. He's babied, it's got 230,000 miles on it. So it's, you know, it's not, it's not his first rodeo. I'd been looking for a 69, so I'd mentioned that I would like to keep the car. In fact, I was going to keep the car. That's when Will chimes in. It'll be not sold the next for three hours. Around here. Go on eBay and check it out. It'll be listed by the end of the day. You know what, just for that, they'll bury me in the son of a I'm calling my attorney right now, and I'm having it put into my will. He actually says, I'm going to be buried in this car. Now, I've been with Mark a long time. Everything's for sale. These are the things that you don't see at home that I have to put up with. You guys wonder why I'm the way that I am, right? Just because I've bought and sold some Mopars over the years, right? And I, and I like to flip cars occasionally. doesn't mean everything's for sale. Everything's for sale. Everything's got a price tag. Nobody's safe. No item's safe. When I said, whoever it is that buys it's going to have to have a gun and a mask because it's not for sale, I meant it. Well, <laughs> okay, whoever buys it's going to have to have a gun and a mask because it's not for sale. He's so persistent that he's going to be buried in this car. It's like, you know, I'm just going to screw with him. I'm going to put a for sale sign on the car and put, like, trade for a box Honda Civic. Here is a great example of Will's sophomore humor. This, this to him is funny. I'm in my office showing the camera guys exactly what it is that I need to do in the course of a day, what cars need to have parts ordered for it, and that kind of thing. When the gal in the front office, Vonda, who isn't with us anymore, I mean, she's still alive, but she just doesn't work here, she chimes in. Hey, Mark, you've got a guy that's interested in the car you have for sale out here? I don't have a car for sale out here. There's some guy in the front office that wants to trade his crap box army green Honda for my Dodge Charger. How you doing? Good. Don't have a, a green charger with a for sale sign. Right out there. Oh, it's funny. Okay. This was great. 
Somebody took the bait right off the bat. It was funny. What that car's not for sale. No? That's cute, though. It says trade for a Honda Civic. I got a sweet <laughs> more a, Honda right there. That's, uh, that's, that's funny. That's funny. What is that? Honda Civic. It says trade for Honda Civic. Oh, God. Thank you for calling Good Your Cars. This is Wanda. Will. To the office, please. I know you guys at home think that's so funny, right? Take somebody's car without permission, park it out front, falsely advertise that it's for sale or for trade for some heap of dung out there. It's not funny, it's a felony. Both start with an F, okay? One of them ends you up in the joint. I've got enough video evidence right here that if I were to call the city prosecutor and present him with the case, he might very well opt to have him indicted. I wanna see him in prison. We can call the cops. What are the cops gonna do? They're gonna come here and laugh with me. Mark's a hard guy to get one over on, and he doesn't ever really get mad, so it really, to get him on this one was really great. You ever see Fletch lives when he walks in that cell? And that great big guy's there, name's Ben. Oh, he has no casket now. He was supposed to be buried in that car and he sold it. <laughs> I sold the car because it was a good business decision, and the point is, now that we've got all that done, we had the car dipped, it is now down in the metal shop, moving through the shop, and I just wanted to innocently share that with you. So, I'm sorry. I keep track of all the cars that are disassembled and waiting in line to go to the dipper. We put them on the racks for storage, and once their number comes up, I bring them back down, take them to Shane, we go over all the parts, inventory, find out what's good, what's bad, and then we put the good parts in the car, we put them up on the rollback, we tie it down, ready for transport to the dipper. So loading and unloading these cars when they're just a bare shell is a very careful process. So since these cars are a unibody car, and we don't take the front inner structure off, the rear quarters are welded on permanently, this car is heavier on the back end than the front. So since we use an overhead boom occasionally to lift these from the top of the car, we have to move the boom towards the rear of the car to balance this thing. So once we drop the car off at the dipper, we just wait for a phone call, and then we just reverse the process. So when the charger came back from the dipper, I mean, it was just a mess. It needed almost every single piece of metal replaced on this car. And that's why when we talk to our clients on how long the car is gonna take, you really can't give a good answer until the car comes back from the dipper. Because in this case, the car looked pretty solid, like it was gonna be a pretty easy build. But once it comes back and the paint jobs and the old body work and all the old sins you can see, and then at that point, you really know how much work you have to build a car. So just to do a quick rundown of what we've replaced so far, along with what we have to replace. We have the left and right front frame rails, left and right shock towers, left and right inner fenders, even the firewall had to be replaced. We did a lot of patchwork in areas that we could get away with it at. On the inside of the car, we had to do the main floor, both rear footwells, and the under seat pan. On the outside of the car, we had to replace both fenders. We had to replace both door shells, rear outer wheel houses with some patchwork on them. We had to replace the trunk floor, the trunk floor extensions, the rear cross member, and we still have to do the rear quarter panels along with the roof. All of that brings us to right now where we're at with the car. The metal guys are ready to install the quarter panels, rear body panel along with the roof which means we need to get the jam work done. All right, so right here, we have a Daytona that we're building. It's not a real Daytona, it's gonna be a tribute with, I believe, a Hellcat's going in it. Wonderful spring green color. The owner of this car wants it F6, light green metallic. Plymouth calls it rally green. This is one of the high impact colors for 1969, but it's also a metallic, and we've only done one other car, which was Johnson Super B. So having another one and being a Daytona is awesome. This car was all done in one big process. So Brody came in, DP90, the whole entire car, which you did great at. At that point, we have our body man come in, do all the seam seal work. As soon as that seam seal work was done, Brody came back in, primered the nose gray because there was some light body work from the aprons and being installed and whatnot. So we got that in primer. Then the next step is Brody came through, shot the whole inside of the back half of the car and inside of the cab gray. And it's a gray that we mix up that's pretty close to factory. You know, this is a transparent color. We've done this color before. So prep work, the amount of coats, the jam work that it takes, you're still treating it like it's the outside of the car. So a lot goes into doing this color. So my teaching method is different. You know, I'll, I take Brody in there and I take my time to go over it, explain the process, what has to happen. And that's good because he's my son and he's learning, but you people at home are actually learning also. 
Once that was done, Brody came through with the actual color of the car and sprayed the outer wheelhouses. Got the whole inside all nice and gray, looks great there. And like I said, the engine compartment's completely primed. So when this car gets all the body work done and it's time to take the car apart, we have our primer work done. So it's just gonna speed up the process a little bit further down the road for us. But other than that, you did a very good job. I appreciate outside it. Outside the runs. You framed me. Nope, just don't run them. You put them there. But that's where we're at. Brody did a great job. Now we can kick this car back over to Jason and he can start hanging the quarters and the whole back half of it, roof, and get it out to the body shop. Hopefully I'll paint. Yeah, I guess I have a Why not? That's a cut. Uh, they didn't say cut. Pete. Let's cut. <laughs> <laughs>now this is something you're going to want to pay attention to so on our 1970 cuda bs27 n zero b that means it's a real life cuda it means it's a 383 four rail high performance engine made in hamtramck all convertibles were made in hamtramck michigan they didn't make any in the la plant so real cuda in violet good colors 383 automatic they made 132 of them so it's not like they made a ton of them they also didn't make one but 132 by the time you break down the codes the features, the options that it has, very good chance. It's a one-of-one -one car. Before I go into the pieces on this car that I want to try to save versus the pieces that are going to have to be replaced and why I'm doing it, we don't usually get to see an original paint car like this other than the outside of the quarter panels have been painted. But I mean, like the inner structure, that's, that's the stuff that's kind of like gold for us old OE restoration guys to look at. I see that the car hasn't been wrecked because of the condition of the front end and the paint that's in the front end. I look at like this area here of the front frame rails on both sides. While that one has a little bit of rust on it, they haven't been swatted. And these cars, when they get hit, these always get crushed, no matter what. If they're punched in the front, those things are manipulated. They are good, square, and straight. You'll see here on the core support, you can see the footprint of where the fender was. And then you can see here, this blacked out area that is kind of prevalent here, over here, all blacked out. You can see the purple coming through it. That was done on the assembly line. They wanted to black out and make sure you couldn't see purple, as a matter of fact, so you couldn't see any color of the body through the grill opening or underneath the bumper between the bumper and the lower valance. Same thing on the upper cowl. They didn't want you looking through the louvers in the hood and seeing purple paint or yellow paint. They didn't want you to be able to stand back when it was opened up and see purple paint. So, this is blacked out, this is blacked out, and this is a good idea of the pattern. Even if you look right here, look at how terrible they did it. It's all the way down to here. We've seen it all over the place. Quality didn't seem to be an issue on the assembly line when they were painting these cowls, which would have been a great job for Will you know, with the no quality situation. And he won't see this, he'll probably cut it before it makes it. I don't understand Mark doing a tutorial on a 1970 Cuda has any involvement or why my name even comes up or even why he takes shots at me. I, I, those, I don't know, I can't, he's too much. He just write checks. Are you an easy target? No, I'm probably the only one that can take it. That's what it comes down to. Doug doesn't know he's getting insulted, so he just laughs. Brian, I mean, it's Brian. Oh, by the way, there are three colors that Chrysler had in 1970 that did not require blackout here or blackout here. F8 green, B7 blue, and black. Because those colors were dark enough, they didn't figure it was worth blacking out on a black car, certainly not, but on the dark blue and the dark green, they thought they were dark enough that they didn't need to black out those cow panels. Okay, let's take a look at the metal condition. Moving into the crucial things on an e-body when it comes to maintaining a numbers matching car. This does have the original numbers matching engine and it has the original numbers matching transmission. It is a 383 Super Commando and it's an automatic transmission. They built 132. That's all they made of 1970 Cudas with a 383 and an automatic. So it's a very low demographic, especially having the original numbers matching. Here are the last eight characters of the vehicle identification number, which match your title, which match your, your fender tag, which match your dash VIN and the door sticker. These also have to match the upper cowl panel. And they do. You can clearly see 242-288. 242-288. So cowl panel, radiator support, both started life on the car. 
all the inner structure sort of life on the car because it's original paint. You can't cheat that. All the spot welds are there. It's obvious. Unfortunately for this car, that is the end of the good news. After that, it's all bad news. This car is an East Coast car. It wasn't well kept. It wasn't preserved. When we're done with this car, we will have replaced the majority of the metal on it. But strategically, and because we are strategically doing this, and because we haven't done one quite like this before, and we've certainly never done a convertible like this, I wanted to take time and show you at home, for those of you who wonder how we save these cars, exactly what is involved and the type of premeditation, the type of forethought these cars have to have before you cut into them. Take a look at that inner fender over there. Look at the, the shock tower, the top of the apron. Look at the back edge where it meets the baffle that goes between the firewall and that. And the same thing over here. Take a look where the hinges mount. This is a real classic area for these things to rust. Up this, uh, again, this area where the apron meets the baffle that connects to the cowl around the shock tower, this is all rotten. That's why you see that line right there because Shane is going to be cutting that off right there. We gotta get this car dipped. So we're trying to figure out how much metal do we wanna take off of it before we have it dipped. So we know that in the end, we've got a couple of aprons. The frame rails don't look bad. If you stand back and you look, there's some problems on them, some problem areas, but they're very repairable at this point until it comes back from dipping. The firewall, however, is not. If you look at the firewall, we got big problems here around the master cylinder area, but a good portion of the upper cow panel is savable. A good portion of it is. What we'll most likely do is put some small patches in here, maybe build this down here with a donor piece off of something out back, this small little area, so we can maintain this. We will have to put a firewall on it. You know, a common question we'll probably have is why bother, right? There's nothing left of the car. Is, is it a real CUDA still? Is it a real BS27 encode car? Well, when you're dealing with a car that is this rusty, but it's also this rare, the name of the game here, just like with the Phantom Cuda, is full transparency. We're not pulling anything. We're not saying this is a granny car with no miles on it that was always mint condition. We're saying this thing was a mess, a hot mess. We're showing you how we restored it. We're not representing it as something it's not. We're saving key components that lend to the credibility of its originality, and they are savable parts. We're not fabricating it. These are savable parts. So that at the end of the day, we are able to save the car. Everybody knows how it was done, and you'll never recognize the before pictures of this car with the after pictures of it. That's the point of saving the car and showcasing it in our show. So once Brody got all the jam work done on the Daytona Tribute, I went in, did a once over, he did a great job. So now we kick it back over to the metal guys to start putting it together for final assembly. You people at home are probably asking, why am I discussing the metal pro process right now with this part? So when you go up to Shane, you try to talk to him, or you guys at home wanna know, man, what's he doing? I would explain something like, hey, we're installing this quarter panel today, X, Y, and Z. Shane goes, <laughs> and then because I know him for so long, I knew what he said, but you people at home don't know that. So Marcus asked me to come in and explain the process because you, you people at home don't know what it means. Quarter panels are always difficult. That's probably one of the hardest parts of the build. So as what Shane is trying to say is, since the quarter panels are such a key part of the build, especially the back half, they have to go in the right spot. You know, one thing leads to another. It's gotta be fit just perfect. And there's a lot of angles that go into. You put the quarter panel on wrong, your trunk's not gonna be right. Your other quarter, your rear body panel's not gonna be right. So it's very important to get that quarter on, rear body panel, and we actually will screw the whole car together to ensure that it's fit correctly before we even start welding. Pull that corner out. To be clear, these are the second best metal guys I got, me being number one. And you have to understand, before I even jam stuff, you know, they fit it four, five, six times. So once I jam it, when it goes back to them, the process is pretty painless. So now it's just as simple as making sure the quarter panel goes right back on where it did when they pre-fit it. We got floors and aprons and front ends down good, but fitting the quarter panel always 
requires a lot of tweaking. You know, being a translator has its ups and downs. It's not fun, but it's also helpful because guys here don't know how to respond to Shane. So they need me to help, to be a buffer, to translate so we can get the job done. So when Shane goes up to Josh, says, Josh is like, dude, what is he, what is he talking? What is, what is that noise? He just mumbles. Is it usually a two person job? Yeah, it makes it easier since it's such a big panel to not distort it. Then I'm, Josh would be like, Will, come over here. And then Shane will look at me and go, and then I look at Josh and tell him what he just said. So I'm a team player. <laughs> Gaps aren't bad. They're really close. We use these shims as a gauge to see how well they fit in the gaps. So we set all of our initial adjustments. We got like a little quarter inch spacer that we use that he checks as he's putting the whole car together to ensure that it stays the same. Now we're hanging the rear body panel. Helps set the width. quarter hooks to the Dutchman, the Dutchman hooks to the other quarter. We screw all that together just to make sure, because it all, it all has to tie together just right. So if you start welding and that quarter's off a little bit, your Dutchman's off, your other quarter's off, your rear body panel's off. So we basically build the whole back half of the car with screws. Looks pretty close. Gonna take a couple more hours of fine tuning. So as we take a look back towards the middle of the car, no real surprises here. If you look, all of the floor is rotted out. Rear step wells are rotted out. Under seat pan is rotted out. No matter how far you back you go, it's, it's got a lot of rust on this car. The rockers, you look at the outside, half the rockers are rotten, the other half is good. Quarter panels, outer wheelhouses, all rotten. How we're going to do this is we're going to make some specific cuts on it so we can send it over and have it dipped. When it comes back, a lot of this stuff is gonna be new Auto Metal Direct sheet metal on it. Starting here forward, we'll cut out what we know for a fact we're not gonna use, send it out and have it dipped. When it comes back, we'll have our hands full. We're gonna to have to do quarters, wheelhouses. The rear body panel actually, oddly enough, is in pretty good shape, at least looking at it from this side. The trunk floor itself is garbage. This is the part that's unique convertible, this opening right here. Now here's something you need to know. If you were to go to AMD, and look up a convertible quarter panel for your CUDA. They don't make them. They only make the full quarter panel. That goes all the way up to the sail where it meets the roof. So what we have to do is section the very key roof opening area around the Dutchman panel, the tops of the quarters. We've got to maintain that because what we're going to do is graft the quarter onto that. The new quarter is going to go onto that, get married together but we're still gonna have the original opening. In this case, it's not really rotten. There is some interstructure damage, but it's there for the most part. So what you see us doing is fabricating a way to make a full quarter panel that would go on a hard top car work on the very, very rare convertible because nobody makes those parts. This wheelhouse cap, that's convertible only. This bar right here, convertible only. This inner structure here for the quarter glass, convertible only. You look down there and you see that it's rotten from the rocker panel up about six inches. We're gonna have to make those pieces. We'll probably be able to use similar pieces from a hard top to be able to make them. The back of the car at a glance looks better than the rest of the car, only because the original Organisol black is on the back end of it. You can see where the footprint of the original emblem was. Remember, CUDA emblems were adhesive in 70 where the Barracuda was a bolt-on emblem. We showed that on one of the previous cars that we worked on, the, the way you can tell that. Trunk gutters, a lot of trunk gutters rust. That's why we can buy them brand new, both sides. This one has a little bit of rust, but by the time you're replacing sections of that quarter, you may end up just wanting to replace the entire gutter. The rear body panel looks pretty good, but until it comes back from the dipper, number one. Number two is, what do you have to do underneath it? Even though this panel may be good, if we have to do frame rails, which we do, I can see that right now, that means you're gonna to have to do this rear cross member right here. If you do the cross member, you might as well do the body panel because they overlap each other. So what we'll end up doing from here is getting the pieces cut off that we know are gonna to have to be replaced. A rear clip, a cowl and windshield, and a front upper tie bar. 
That's what we are starting with. We have an idea now what we want to do, but when it comes back from the dipper, it could be a completely different thing. The, the whole game could change. We may be replacing parts that I'm telling you right now we can save. We may be saving parts that I'm saying we can't save. But that's one of 132 cars, folks. So you make every effort in the world you can to preserve it and keep it as original as humanly possible. Still to come, Shane and Jason cut loose on a rare and valuable 1970 383 Cuda. But after all the sparks fly, what will be left of this FC7 convertible? We didn't know they were going to be with a fortune someday. Mark and Tony may finally be stumped with a Challenger and its mysterious additions. I just can't get a handle on why it was done. And the team rounds out the details on the Daytona Trivia with helpful insights from Will. Those areas that you can't get, you have to make well. When Graveyard Cars returns. Listen, none of us know exactly what leads up to a car getting like this or becoming abandoned or neglected. It's an East Coast car, so they salt the roads. If you're on the coast, you've got all the salt water. But steps could have been made to preserve it along the way. But let's face another thing. In the 70s, when a lot of these cars got parked, we didn't know they were going to be worth a fortune someday. If we did, we would have preserved them differently. At the end of the day, the car is completely cut apart. What you see left is what we have left. Upper tie bar, cowl and firewall, rockers, which we won't be using, but they establish the length of the car and the rear body. Basically, a little bit of chassis and a little bit of body. Set those together like a little model car. So now when you look at this, it makes a lot more sense. These are the parts that we're saving, why we're saving them. And then next time you see the car, they'll be back from the dipper. We'll show you the parts, what they look like, where we're putting them on, and we'll start building us a convertible 70 Cuda 383 automatic, one of only 132 ever made. Teaching Jason to put a quarter panel on. It's my favorite part of putting a quarter panel on is having somebody else do it. So what Shane's trying to say, you people heard, ooh, ooh, ooh. So what that means is, once the quarters have been fit, the doors have been fit, the fenders have been fit, everything is square and looks good, he's able to weld. You'll see that Jason's using a MIG welder as opposed to our car line or spot welder because you can't get to everything with a spot welder and those areas that you can't get, you have to MIG weld. When you're welding these quarters on, you know, we start at the front of the quarter where it matches that meets the door and then work our way back. After the leading edge is welded, the next spot is the rocker area. And you'll notice we have all the vice grips holding everything in place. So as we go, we'll start pulling the vice grips off. Let's do some spot welds in the back too to help move it around. From here, yeah. here, here. Uh -huh. So once the rocker area is tacked in place, we're able to move on to the wheelhouse next. So there's a lot of spot welds on a wheelhouse. So he'll go through and weld in between the clamps. And then at that point, remove the clamps and then finish his welding. I like to have a move around so it keeps the heat distributed more evenly. So far, so good. Everything meshed together pretty well. And then you can go back to the front, weld some more, and then go to the bottom, get a couple tacks there. Make sure that bottom's straight too, though. Yes, that is key. Once it's all tacked into place, they weld it up. Every one of those cars left the assembly line with the bolt hole utilized in the original stock position, not the forward one, and in the original seat mounting bracket. They never used those two provisions that were there. They may have thought they needed them. That's what we want to know. Why are they there?
few weeks ago before I came out, Mark got a hold of me and he sent me some pictures of this Challenger convertible he was working on and it had double brackets on it for mounting the bottom part of the rear seat and also had an extension welded on for relocating the rear outer seat belts on this Challenger convertible. The more research I did and hands-on looking at it, I still don't think I 100% have a grasp of what exactly they were trying to do with it because it just doesn't make sense with anything that you could try to apply logic to. Well, the fact that the Challenger is a two inch longer wheelbase, two inch longer car than the Cuda is from in the e-bodies. And it's in that it's section. It's made right? in the step the rear footwell. If I took a, a CUDA rear footwell and a challenger, you're gonna see oh, right about a two inch difference. Right. And that's how they carried it all the way through the car. And so we're looking at things that happened that are about two inches difference, and so we're going along with it. The Dodge Challenger has a two inch longer wheelbase than the Barracuda does. And they get that two inches right there in that rear step well, right in that step well. Your common sense would say, ah, oh, that must be why they felt they needed to put the hook forward, right? Here's the thing. First off, if you look carefully, you see the extension piece that was put on the seatbelt anchoring? Right, it's got the booger weld on it. You got know, the boogered up weld, right. kind of like a torque box. It yeah. definitely wasn't done on the assembly line. Done on the assembly line, but not spot welded on when right. the floor pans were made. This was an afterthought, like the, you know, like the torque boxes were put on after. You know, I've come across other oddities or something that's maybe seem like a mistake and usually after a period of time thinking about it and, and getting to it, you, you may not agree with the logic behind it, but at least you could figure it out and see why it was done. So if you take and you measure from the back hole to the front hole, the added on hole, it's two inches exactly as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And okay. same thing with those clips. The hooks that mount to the floor, the dual hooks that are right. here. So it tells you that something about a convertible needed a provision in there to be able to move everything two inches to forward. Everything, the rear seat. Here's the problem with that philosophy. Yeah, the Challenger's longer than the Barracuda. Tony and I went out back and we looked at all of the convertibles we had, which I think were three Barracudas and two Challengers. Every one of the Challengers have the extra provision at the front of the under seat pan and the extended piece for the side anchoring. However, Every one of those cars left the assembly line with the bolt hole utilized in the original stock position, not the forward one, and in the original seat mounting bracket. They never used those two provisions that were there. Going by this, showed that the rear seat bottom needed to come forward two inches. That's right. On this e-body convertibles, we start thinking. That's how it started off and then you went right. and checked the CUDA convertible. So it brings us back over to this. Okay, let's say it's a Challenger only. We did make sense out of it being two inches further away from the front of the car, who knows. But as we lay out the seats, we don't see the evidence in the difference between a hard top seat back. Front to back. Front to back. Front to back, right. Front Left to, back. to right, yes, but right. front, front to, to back. back. Yeah. Which is where you'd need this provision. I just can't get a handle on this here. I, I, I can't connect the dots on this and figure out why it was done. But even so, I, I, let me jump in because if the difference in the two inches for the Challenger to Cuda is there, why are they making the modification here? So the additions were never used and we initially thought the reason for this had something to do with the Challenger wheelbase being two inches longer, which is all made up in the foot section, the floor pan, the well, in front of where the rear seats go but we figured there might have been something along with that, but there's not because the seats are the same from Cuda to Challenger. They're just different from convertible to hardtop. The Cuda convertibles don't have this because we've checked a couple here. So it's only on Challengers and we still don't know why. All of it supports that they thought, that some genius thought everything needed to be moved forward. And we are looking at one right now that they've moved things forward, they put provisions there, was never even needed, nope. and, if a, and if a modification was needed, it would have been that way. It was supposed to go the other way. So here's where the problem lies. The under seat pan is the same on a Barracuda and a Challenger. The measurement from the back vertical edge of the under seat pan to the seat mounting area is the same on a Challenger and a Barracuda because they use the same seat frame. The extension is ahead of where the seat mounts. You see what I'm saying? Why would you need to move it forward to compensate for the two inch length when the measurement is identical? The same frame, the same under seat pan, everything is the same. I want to know why. I really feel it's an engineering mistake. So I think on the drawing board, 
that they said, okay, a convertible, we're gonna have to move the rear seat bottom forward more was wrong. They but didn't why think about where it was gonna be needed but to be why, moved forward. But they only did it on the Challengers, not the Cudas. But it's the two inches that makes the Challenger it's, longer now. That's, that's what kept throwing us off on the right. thinking. Out of all the cars I've looked at over the past 10 years at Graveyard Cars, this one here has got me. I don't have an answer. We've always been able to come with some kind of answer and figure out why. I don't know why this was done. So there's our unsolved mystery. If you at home happen to have either worked on the assembly line, know somebody that worked on it, have copies of the original engineering plans that show these, or a technical service bulletin, something that addresses it, we would love to see it. Send us an email, talk to us on social media, tell us what you know. This 1970 Plymouth Cuda was built at the LA assembly plant. It left that assembly plant with a 440 six barrel engine and a four speed manual transmission. It's painted EV2, tour red, has a white vinyl top and is one of 902 ever made. It also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. Remember, fender tags are red from left to right, bottom to top, so let's take a look. E87 440 six barrel engine. D21 heavy duty four speed manual transmission. BS23, B stands for Barracuda, S stands for Cuda model, and 23 means it's a two door hardtop. V0E, the V means it's a 440 six barrel engine. The zero represents the model year, which is 1970. E means it was built at the Los Angeles assembly plant. 102928, that is the vehicle serial number. Moving up a line, we have EV2, tour red, H6XW, all vinyl bucket seats in white. 000, one piece interior door trim panel. 908. That means the car was built on September 8th, 1969. 017114 is the unique shipping order number. V1W, white vinyl top. A33 is a track pack. That means it has a 354 Dana rear axle. A62, rally instrument cluster. C55, bucket seats. G31, left hand outside chrome racing mirror. G33, right hand outside chrome racing mirror. Going up another row, we have J25, variable speed wipers. J45, hood pin tie downs. M21, drip rail moldings. M25, body seal moldings. M88, deck treatment moldings. M91, luggage rack, which is a very rare option. Now we're moving up to N41, dual exhaust. N42, bright exhaust tips. N85, tachometer, R22, AM 8-track stereo. Again, V1W, white vinyl top. And our last row, we have V5W, body side moldings in white. 26, because it has a 26 inch radiator, which is max cooling. END, it's the end of our sales code and the end of this week's autopsy report. Stay tuned. Work continues on the Daytona Tribute, dishing out the details when blending metal and fiberglass parts for a rock solid build. Factory used a metal plug, and we're using a fiberglass composite plug now. With wing cars getting more and more rare, will Mark and his team be able to keep the species alive? It is not a real one, it's just other than the vehicle identification number, you're never gonna know it. Shane and Jason forge ahead with a Daytona Tribute, but will Jason adapt quickly enough to stick around? Don't get any panel bond in your clothes, it'll never come out. But don't worry, if any of this is confusing, Will Scott is here to help. So, when Graveyard Cars returns, Back to the Daytona Tribute car. 
Once they finish the quarters, the rear body panel, at that point, they're able to move on to the roof and the rear window plug. Shane's done a couple of these now, so he's got it down. So once the quarters and the Dutchman, all that's welded in place, he's able to go ahead and throw the rear body plug for the back window in place. Then at that point, he'll go through panel bond it all up, and it's about ready for uh, the mud guys. We want to make sure to pre-fit everything, no matter what part it is. Every piece has to be pre-fit multiple times. This will be the second Daytona Tribute we built. Makes it easier the second time around. Now we'll be able to final fit the roof and the plug a little more to get the core panels just right. Next, we'll be spot welding the roof on. To date, we have restored two real Daytona XX29 Dodge Chargers. We passed on one that was not repairable. We have restored a Tribute Superbird, or SEMA car, with the Hellcat in it. However, you're talking about a rare demographic of cars. You are talking about 503 Daytonas made, 1920 Superbirds ever built. So they're getting non-existent. The idea of building a quality, accurate Tribute car to those grandfathers of NASCAR is a great way to continue the passion in the hobby. I have no problem as long as everybody knows it's a tribute, a clone, whatever you wanna call it. It is not a real one, it's just other than the vehicle identification number, you're never gonna know it. Now we're getting ready to put the plug in the 69 Daytona Tribute. We're gonna glue it in with panel bond adhesive. Jason's here to learn and to help with the process. The window plug fits right in between the two quarter panels, and the plug fits in between the two layers of flanges. The factory used a metal plug, and we're using a fiberglass composite plug now. Okay, so what Shane's doing now is... Next, we'll have to put some panel bond on the plug also so both surfaces are covered. I'm very excited to get this portion of the car done. Then we can move on to the front, and then it'll start looking like a Daytona. I pre-drilled some screw holes so it will set right in place. Now we're getting ready to place all the rivets in. I already pre-fit and drilled everything so it will line up perfectly. Don't get any panel bond in your clothes, it'll never come out. So that's what Shane did on the last part of that car. Hopefully you guys were pay paying attention. I don't want to rivet on the exterior cosmetic panel like they used to in the old days because they always would show through later. So I try to keep all the rivets to where you don't see them. Now that panel bond is so strong, you don't need to rivet as much and it makes a better product in the end. I really hope we get you to translate everybody here. Yeah, I mean, I can do that, but I think it's important to learn. If you're a fan of the show and this is what I gotta work with, you need to learn. So that way I don't have to do this.